It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. Last time they played the Panthers, there's all those spooky vibes for Halloween, but now it's Thursday night, and I think these games are just, like, cursed. Bless Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreit for calling all these games <laughs> week after week, especially the Falcons last night. They were just not ready for a national audience. Look, I am exhausted mentally, physically, <laughs> emotionally, <laughs> spiritually. I'm just tired, <laughs> and I think everybody feels that way. I am on the same page as you for sure on that one. Well, in the end, two really tough losses for Atlanta in the span of five days. 25-15 to 15 was the final score but it certainly didn't feel that close. Let's huddle up about it. Let's huddle up with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. Everybody, of course, talking about Marcus Mariota. Marcus Mariota himself said he was trying to do too much. I think there's a lot to unpack here, but let's start with what Arthur Smith said about it. I know those are the, the popular narratives uh, right out there. Those are the easy questions to ask. As a whole football team, we got to do a better job. Start with myself. You can make it about the quarterback. How about about the team? So we got an opportunity at the end of the fourth quarter of the last two weeks, and uh, we got to get better. And uh, we're thankful that we got an opportunity to come back and do that with seven games left. So, yeah, I'd say Arthur Smith will not be starting Desmond Ritter as soon as the fan base wants them to. Until the Falcons are completely eliminated from playoff contention, which could be a while in this NFC South that no one seems to want to win, he's going to be riding with Mariota. Arthur Smith was asked point blank after the game if he ever thought at any point about putting Desmond Ritter in for Marcus Mariota, and he answered with a quick and resounding no. And look, I get it. That was not the environment or the situation I think you want to throw Ritter into, but I also get wanting to to see Ritter and y'all yes we are going to get into that later in the show <laughs> a little teaser there well the Falcons won the lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball from the start the Falcons offensive line looked really out of character really and they were getting their lunch eaten big time Chris Lindstrom who's been one of the more solid guys on this offensive line was getting worked by Derek Brown every snap it seemed what was going on there and how much did that kind of affect the entire offensive operation yeah so I'm actually glad that you brought up Chris Lindstrom because we had a conversation in the locker room that I thought was one of the most honest conversations I feel like I've had with a player to this point. Chris Lindstrom said without hesitation that the offensive line just wasn't good enough on Thursday night. His words were that they needed to be better for the team, better for Marcus, and better for each other as a unit. He was also honest about the slow start saying for some reason it just felt like something wasn't right and that something wasn't clicking. He said they talked it through and they did kind of get going a little bit in the second half but by that time it felt almost a little bit too little too late. I'm sure a lot of you heard Dean Pease's rant about taking away positives from a loss while the Falcons defense limited Carolina to six of 15 on third down and one of two in the red zone. Now for the bad news, but they're straight up facts. So we're going to talk about them led by Deontay Foreman. The Panthers rushed 47 times for 232 yards on the Falcons. The most the Dirty Birds have given up all year. Foreman alone added 130 and a touchdown. The Panthers are really doing their best Falcons impression, weren't they? I couldn't have said it better myself. It really felt like the Panthers were playing the Falcons brand of football, which is winning the line of scrimmage and running the heck out of the ball. However, I will say this. Yes, I realize that the defense gave up too many rushing yards, and I know they probably should have had a few interceptions, but they also kept Carolina out of the end zone on all but two of their 11 total drives on Thursday. That, and they forced four three and outs. Even with the stat line looking like it does, I will say that this defense did give this offense many opportunities to keep the Falcons in this game. Yeah, and when you only give up 25 points, your offense should be able to come back in that one. Well, because of this week's schedule, we have actually two games of fits to go through, so let's get to it. We're walking in presented by Wells Fargo. Let's start with Cordero Patterson last week who made his much anticipated return last Sunday. Is there a bigger flex in wearing yourself on a t-shirt? If anyone could pull it off, it is certainly CP. Yeah, only CP could do this and one, look this good and two, get away with it. Even in the loss of the Chargers, which I believe is when this the day this pick was taken, CP was a bright spot for the Falcons team without question. Absolutely. Now for Grady Jarrett who popped off with this Versace number over here. Here. I'm a big fan of all the color going on here. It's bright, it's fun, it's happy. We kind of need those vibes today more than ever. But wait, there is more. It is a matching set. Pajamas, but make it high fashion. It wasn't too long ago that I believe we were talking about Casey Hayward's matching leather set that looks like some right. classy loungewear. Well, Grady is giving him a run for his money with this fit. It is a good one. Now for some of the Thursday night fits. Bradley Pinion throwing it back. The Falcons had one of their best games.
changing the throwback unis. I'm just saying, maybe bring them back. But yeah, I love this simple casual look here. I love this jacket so much, and I don't know what material this is, but it's fantastic, and I actually do need to know. It looks great. Michael Walker hitting us with a double-breasted suit. I see you, number three, a classic <laughs> look for the business trip, and I just love the navy pinstripes. Yeah, no, I, I, it's Michael Walker has been a Falcons Fit nominee a few times this year, and thinking back, he really goes for the cool and trendy streetwear vibes normally, but not this. This is very dapper, sir. Right? It was a very different look, and I'm here for it. Well, underneath those fabulous fits, there are a lot of cool, meaningful tattoos. We asked the Falcons about their favorite ink in our question of the week. I have a whole sleeve and some of my chest left side only. I stopped uh, like my third year in college. For some reason, I just stopped. I don't know, maybe I got busy, but um, so the whole left side, yeah, I got God on the cross on my forearm. Mm -hmm. um, I got a scripture about family on my bicep. I got me and my great mom, great grandma birthday on my, on my uh, outside of my forearm. And then there's a a dove. Oh, nice. Yeah, a dove up here. Top it off. My favorite one, I would say this one. Yeah. They say the one and only. What's that for? Because there's only one person in the world that's me. I might come back next year with the full body he's done and some pictures and you know what I'm saying, just switch up the whole swag, you know, totally lose my identity. Got it. <laughs> my favorite tattoo, um, I'll probably say it's the old English L and it has all my siblings and um, my parents' names in it and it's the same exact place as my dad's tattoo, so we got the both same exact one. That one Love sounds that. really cool, yeah. but like Grady, I don't have any tattoos, do you? No, I don't, but I do appreciate a nice story of why they got the art that they did. I think that's really awesome. And I liked how Richie Grant really gave us the play-by-play -play on all of his <laughs> tattoos. Appreciate him for that. Well, still to come, we welcome in Lacey Jane Brown, who was just in the A on her world record tour of all 32 NFL stadiums. Stay tuned for that fun conversation later in the show. Plus, the Falcons this week hosted eight families who have lost loved ones in the line of duty. That story is coming up next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. The Falcons hit the road for last night's game in Charlotte, and they brought eight special families with them this week as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Over the last couple of years, the Falcons have given back to military families through TAPS, a national nonprofit that offers resources for those grieving the, left, the death of a loved one lost in the line of duty. They always welcome these families for a weekend in Atlanta, walkthrough on Saturday and the game on Sunday. This year, eight families attended walkthrough earlier this week in Flowery Branch and were on hand for last night's game in Charlotte. Falcons coaches and staff even wore shirts with the fallen heroes names on them as well. Pretty cool stuff there. Well, there were two Falcons names trending on Twitter Thursday night, Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter. Tori, you've christened those who call for QB2 as the Ritter ruckus, which I love. <laughs> and while they may be a ruckus, they may not be exactly realistic, right? Here's the thing. Let's just go over the situation that was Thursday night. It's rainy. It's gross. They're coming off a short week. The run game isn't working at the clip that it normally does. The protection isn't as solid as it normally is. And to be fair, the last time the Falcons played the Panthers, Marcus Mariota actually had one of his highest completions rates of the year. So yeah, I get why we didn't see Desmond Ritter, but this is not me saying that we shouldn't see Desmond Ritter. I actually would very much like to see what the Falcons have in the rookie quarterback. However, I want to see him after a full week of prep as the starter with the first team offense. I think that is when you will be able to get the best evaluation of him that you need. And it's almost like we've talked about that before yeah. on this very show. Well, <laughs> last night was yucky and rainy, as you mentioned, but the Falcons had one of their coldest games of the year in all phases. But we're going to heat it up with some hot takes coming up later and, on. And TikTok content sports creator Lacey Jane Brown joins us in the next coming up next. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. 
We are so excited to have TikTok content creator Lacey Jane Brown with us. You're currently on pace to break a world record, which is crazy. You're going to 32 NFL home games in 73 days. You're just at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on Sunday. So what'd you think of that? I honestly loved it. So first off, I love the, the Halo video board. That was incredible. And secondly, I feel like one of the most underrated parts about it is the food. Concessions are so cheap. Like I literally went in, I got three hot dogs because it's the price of a normal <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> They're $2. So I was like, this is incredible. I, I loved it. I had a good time. Um, unfortunately, Falcons didn't come out with a win, but the stadium itself is beautiful. The outside is beautiful. The inside is beautiful. Concessions, 10 out of 10. <laughs> Hot dogs are cheap. I mean, what can, what more could you ask for at a I know, I know. <laughs> I always get hot dogs too because they're typically like the cheapest thing. And I was like, right. I get three now for the price of one. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Now for those that don't know, what inspired you to try and go after this world record that you're trying to set? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually like a very kind of confusing thing. I never really share it. But um, so basically my nephew inspired me. He's been battling cancer for 10 years. He's 10 years old, hugest sports fan that I ever, ever known. Like he's incredible, but I'm doing this for him. And at every single sporting event, you'll see me buy a hat or whatever. Every single game, I'm buying something for him. So the hats all at the end of all of this tour are going straight towards him. I'm gonna like gift it all to him. So he's the he's the reason why I'm doing this. Life's too short and uh, he's kind of living the adventure through me. Oh, I absolutely love that. That is so sweet. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So you've got 13 more stops on this tour, if I counted correctly. Um, what's been your favorite stadium or even maybe your favorite fan base to be around on this tour so far? Yeah, I would probably say my favorite stadium would be Allegiant Stadium, but my favorite fan base would be Ravens. And I feel like the reason why I'm saying Ravens is I have now gone to three games and they've all won every single game. So it's maybe like, you know, I'm seeing the best of them, <laughs> but they're, they're all so welcoming, so nice, genuinely so much fun, very, very loyal. At every away game, Tampa Bay and Saints, there were so many Ravens fans. Like, I love it. I, I love that fan base, big fan of them. And I'm obviously a Chiefs fan myself, so I'm not going to say Kansas City Chiefs because that's a little biased. I don't even think I'm super biased, so. <laughs> so with this, I mean, nonstop crazy tour that, that you've got going on, what has kind of been a favorite memory of yours uh, now that we're kind of 10 weeks into the season? Yeah, a favorite memory of mine would um, probably be with the Houston Texans, actually. Um, so they had their first like reveal of a new helmet that they've ever used in their franchise. It was a battle red, like shiny chrome helmet. And before the game, I actually got to like try on the helmet and um, it was just a really cool experience. I got to walk through the tunnel, which their tunnel has this bowl that's like blowing smoke out of its nose <laughs> like it's insane but i actually got to fully experience that and it was just incredible like i loved it i really wasn't expecting a ton um the texans lost but the experience was 10 out of 10 i loved it um it was a really cool opportunity to be a part of you mentioned the ravens fan base being one that you really liked interacting with is there one fan base that you found with your content that they're super reactive to it or one fan base that kind of like always comments on your stuff no matter what and what's maybe like a favorite story that you have about that yeah, I would say Broncos. I, I feel like my really? issue with them, yeah, I feel like my issue with them is also like I am a Chiefs fan. Like, and so I feel like a lot of people just regardless are like, she's going to say something negative about the Broncos. But I, I'm not ever saying anything negative. But I think the fact is I went to three Broncos games in a row and they all lost every single game, <laughs> even their home game. And the games were so so rough to watch and so like I think that's why I got the Broncos fans like kind of like mm -mm, this, this, she can't go to our games anymore because that is like the curse but um, that would definitely be the fan base for sure and it could be because I'm a Chiefs fan but yeah. 
That's definitely them. That's fantastic. Rock those country, let's ride. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> when is the last time that you were home? Like, how have you just like packed for this yeah. whole time? Do you check like 15 bags? Like, what? How are you doing this logistically? I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I check two bags, and um, that's all that I really do. So I actually don't really have a home right now. So I moved from <laughs> Portland, and I just like put my clothes at my family's I have like uh, my sister lives in Texas so I just put it there it's all randomly like for the Texans game I was there so I randomly was like all right let me put new stuff together but um yeah now like I've I've been from Atlanta and then I'm going to Charlotte on Thursday then I'm gonna be in Buffalo New York on Sunday and then <laughs> it's just like north south weather so it's like I don't know if I packed right probably did it but <laughs> we'll figure it out well thank you so much we really appreciate the time what an awesome cool journey that you're on anyone who wants to catch the full conversation with Lacey, head to fox5atlanta.com and we'll be right back on rise up tonight hey atlanta this is head crack talking and you watching rise up tonight presented by at&t Like, I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. You can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives because it sets up bad, you know, narratives. So you can frame the narrative. You can write narratives. So those are easy narratives. And Two tough, tough losses this week for the Falcons, but Tori and I are 2-0 and on our hot takes after that Sunday game. Love Cordero it. Patterson scored not one, but two, almost three touchdowns. Tyler Algier and Caleb Huntley added to the rushing attack, but then they only amassed 138 yards on the ground yesterday. So it goes. The fans are going to hate this hot take, but the fans don't run this show we do. I'm going to say it. It's the easy narrative Arthur Smith talks about to blame Marcus Mariota for this loss. And he'll be the first to tell you he played real bad yesterday. But the offensive line wasn't working. The run game wasn't working. This entire offense wasn't working. Yes, your quarterback should be able to get you out of that. But I think this Falcons coaching staff needs to ask themselves during this mini buy, how can they maybe reshape or rework this offense to fit Mariota better going forward? He looked better when they went tempo later in the game and he had quicker reads. It's not the play calling. It's not the scheme. It's the execution that isn't there and opposing defenses aren't going to just stop going all in on the run unless the Falcons give them a reason to basically what this offense is trying to execute right now is clearly not working for Marcus Mariota. So maybe it's time to try something else. Very well said and I'm going to keep with this holistic approach for my hot take. Let's be honest. The Falcons are one. No two game winning field goal misses from having lost their last four games. It kind of feels like they're on a slide right now. And my hot take is that if they do not evolve, that slide may very well continue. The next necessary step in this team's evolution is to become consistent. It's not something we've really truly seen them be in the last four weeks. And I think this team has to be in order to come up with a decisive win before the bye week next month. Yeah, you got to stop the bleeding. And the Falcons have a couple extra days to get right here. But next Sunday it doesn't look like an easy matchup with the Bears at the bench. Justin Fields is on one lately. He broke the record for most rushing yards by a quarterback in a single regular season game with 178 yards Man. against the Dolphins. That's insane. He scrambled for eight first downs, including five on third down. He's a problem, and he's going to have quite a homecoming in Atlanta next Sunday if the Falcons don't clean up their run defense. Oh, yeah, and doesn't Arthur Smith know it? He mm -hmm. was actually the one that brought it up post game after the Carolina loss that he said, Look, the Falcons know they have their work cut out for them because Chicago is going to run the ball, as he put it, 500 times, and they have to figure <laughs> out a way to stop it. That's going to be a tough matchup. I don't think any of us had that on paper to start the season, that that was going to be a big one in the Benz. You know, I truly didn't at the beginning, but <laughs> that's how the season has gone so far. It's been crazy from start to now we're week 10 in. There's been a lot of things not on either of our bingo cards this season, but we will roll on. Mini buy for the team this week, but our schedule doesn't change. We'll be back with you next Friday night to look ahead to that Bears matchup in the Benz next Sunday afternoon. Thanks for watching Rise Up Tonight tonight. Have a wonderful weekend and peaceful Sunday off, hopefully.